The Livestream.net presents On the Way to a Smile Case of Shinra At the ancient ruins, the mission is signed to Sung, leader of the Shinra Company's Department of Administrative Research, also known as the Turks, was to obtain the ancient and mysterious stone known as the Black Materia. Just as he had almost fulfilled his mission, Sephiroth suddenly appeared and severely wounded him, leaving him on the verge of death. The bleeding wouldn't stop, and he could feel his consciousness slipping away. Just when he had already accepted death, Aerith and her friends appeared. They too had arrived in pursuit of Sephiroth. For a long time, Sung's main duty had been to monitor Aerith, a descendant of the Ancients, waiting for the right moment to recruit her for the Shinra company. Occasionally he would feel pressure to use some of his subordinates' more persuasive methods. But all in all, this practice was an exception within the Shinra company. Previously they had tried to control Aerith's biological mother with force, but unfortunately this led to her death. This new approach was clearly a consequence of this earlier failure. Sung's guilt made him reflect heavily on his own actions. Aerith was the last remaining descendant of the Ancients. Sung felt unworthy to be in the presence of such a majestic existence as her. He embodied the dark machinations of the company he served. He couldn't let himself get too close. The first time Aerith spoke to him was when she was still just a child. Thank you for your hard work, as always. At first, Sung couldn't believe what he had just heard from the young girl. Seeing how silent he stayed, Aerith continued. You're protecting me, aren't you? When Sung thought about his mission, it was probably best to take advantage of this situation. But Sung went ahead and told her the truth. That was probably the most honest moment of his life. I'm Sung, from Shinra Company. There's something I'd like to speak to you about. I hate Shinra! As he watched the young girl run off, Sung was relieved. He felt that he had done the right thing. Even if the day came when he would have to take her away by force, he still wouldn't be able to lie to her. Years passed. Eventually Aerith came into contact with the anti-Shinra group Avalanche, and the situation took a sudden change. Sung became agitated by Aerith's political stance. He couldn't get a grasp on the situation at hand, and because of that, he treated Aerith with an attitude of such pretense evil that even his subordinates turned cold toward him. He tried to think of what he should say to them. This isn't pretense evil. To Aerith, Shinra itself is evil. That's why evil should act like evil. In the end, aware of his approaching death, he chose to approach Aerith as a Turk. Damn it. Letting Aerith go was the start of my mistakes. Even so, Aerith still shed tears for Sung. She didn't see him as an enemy, but rather a casual acquaintance who had watched over her since she was a child. Sung knew that this unexpected encounter at the moment of his death was something positive, but all he could mutter was a sarcastic comment. I'm not dead yet. After Aerith left, Sung quietly awaited his death. But it never came. He was drifting in and out of consciousness, but he still couldn't feel his spirit merging with the livestream. It was Reeve who saved Sung in the end. An odd little robot cat, riding on the back of a giant moogle, appeared before Sung. Reeve was assigned the mission to spy on Aerith and her comrades using this robot cat. That was close, Mr. Sung. Where's the black materia? There was no answer. The robot stood frozen, as if it had stopped working. It took a while before it began speaking again. <laughs> Excuse me, <laughs> I'm controlling both number one and number two at the same time. It can be a little difficult. I see. Sung had no idea how difficult it actually was, but he waited for Reef to speak again so that he didn't disturb his concentration. I've handed over the black materia to Cloud for the time being. That's a wiser choice than letting Sephiroth have it, aye? Cloud, 
The fact that he was so closely linked to this chain of events was a mystery. But on the other hand, it was logical, inevitable even. Somehow Cloud was the key to all of this, but no matter how much Sung thought about it, he couldn't figure out exactly how he fit. In any case, the black materia was better off in Cloud's hands if he wanted to prevent the ultimate black magic meteor from being summoned. Cloud has the black materia. I see. As for yourself, Mr. Soon, I'll contact Shinra for you. Right. Oh, uh, one more thing. My identity as a spy has been found out, but I'll be staying with them. They are quite an interesting bunch. I'm very interested in what they'll do next. Right, let's get you moved somewhere. Song had a lot of questions for him, but as he was lifted up by the giant Mughal, he lost consciousness due to the pain. His memories of what happened next were sketchy at best. Three men carried Sung onto the boat. The men were his former superior and his subordinates. Why had Reeve contacted them and not the company directly? Had he been in constant contact with them? Question after question came to mind, but Sung didn't have the strength to say anything. He was unconscious for most of the trip. When he came to, he found himself in a small room. The air had a distinct smell of sea foam and rusted metal. He knew he had been taken to Junor. A doctor arrived almost immediately and began his treatment. While Sung was incapacitated, Aerith was killed, and the black materia was now in Sephiroth's possession. He used it to summon the ultimate black magic, Meteor. It was said that upon impact, Everything on the planet would be gone within three to seven days. Ultimately, it was meaningless whether the planet was destroyed in three days or seven days. The people needed some ray of hope to cling on to, something to focus on. Midgar, Sector Zero, close to the Shinra building. On huge pillars constructed almost overnight in Sector Eight sat a dangerous looking weapon a cannon hastily flown in from Junon. Scarlet, head of the Department for Weapons Research, was responsible for overseeing the development of this super weapon, naming it Sister Ray. It seemed like a funny name, considering this was their last defense against Sephiroth. Sister Ray was connected to all of the macro reactors surrounding Midgar by a pipeline system, and the power was further amplified by means of a huge materia. The cannon was expected to completely destroy Sephiroth, who lay dormant in the northern crater, a large cave to the far north. It was hoped that if Sephiroth died, the nightmare in the sky which he had summoned would also disappear. As soon as the threat to the planet had passed, the all-powerful weapons would surely return from whence they came. Theoretically, it's perfect. Rude looked up at Sister Ray. Theoretically? What about non-theoretically? It leaves me concerned. Then I'm relieved. What do you mean? I thought I was the only one worried. Are we seriously going to fire this thing? Don't we have to test it out first? Will Midgar be alright? Would you be reassured if I said it'll be alright? Hey, don't get mad. Unfortunately, Sister Ray didn't fulfill their expectations and ended up as a pile of scrap metal. At the same time, a bombardment of fire from one of the weapons took out the upper floors of the Shinra building. As members of the Turks, Reno and Rude were used to the sight of destroyed buildings, but they felt differently about the Shinra building. They spent most of their time on outside missions, rather than pushing pencils around, so this building was like a home they could return to after their work was done. The gratitude of their colleagues, the scoldings from their superiors, joking and flirting with the female staff. When they're out, they're on duty. But when they were back at the office, they could just kick back. It was the complete opposite for the regular staff. Nevertheless, or perhaps because of it, the Shinra building was a very important place to them. Reno and Root's concern grew stronger when they learned that the company president, Rufus Shinra, was missing. There were many staff who witnessed the president's office receiving a direct hit from weapons energy beam, so the word missing in this case had a very different meaning. There was also uncertainty about the fate of most of the board members and senior staff. 
the Shinra company had nobody to lead it. There were also many employees who had already left their positions. It was understandable that they had more important things in their lives to think about. Reno and Rude waited for the elevator so they could go up to the president's office and see what had happened to Rufus. The direct elevator to the executive floors wasn't working, so they would have to try the regular staff elevators. This thing ain't moving. It looks like the emergency lock system was activated. They managed to get that working pretty well. Reno, Rude, take the stairs. The two looked at each other blankly before turning in the direction of the voice. A long-haired man they were all too familiar with stood before them. They definitely hadn't expected to see him here. Chief! They had received reports that Sung had died. Elena had even sworn vengeance for her boss and pursued Cloud and his party to the northern crater. But she returned to Midgar unsuccessful. They both had vivid memories of how she had come back cursing and repeating the word revenge like she was under a spell. All of the Turks were still under the belief that Sung was dead. What's wrong? Reno and Rude look completely dumbfounded. You're alive, Chief. As you can see. But now's not the time to explain. Reno nodded several times to show that they needed no further explanation. Sung! Suddenly they heard the voice of a young woman. The three turned around to find Elena standing there. The youngest member of the Turks made no attempt at all to hide her joy at finding her chief still alive. She quickly ran to Sung and hugged him. Oh, come on, Elena. You know I want to do that, too. No need to hold back. I'll pass. Sung placed a firm hand on Elena's shoulder and stepped back a little. He took a good look at his three subordinates and nodded. Come on. Time to get to work. Shinra's office had received a direct hit from weapons attack. A smile crossed his face as he began to slip away into darkness. The idea that such monsters as the weapons lay dormant within the planet was frightening. The shockwave from the blast had knocked Rufus to the floor. The whole building was rocked by explosions. Steel ceiling tiles dislodged and fell to the floor, narrowly missing Rufus's head. He quickly dragged himself onto the desk to avoid the falling debris. He was prepared for his death the moment he saw the weapon's fire heading toward him. But anger welled up inside him. Anger at himself that he had actually accepted death. How could he even think that? Why would he accept his death? What did it mean? The anger let him think clearer. The weapon might attack again. He had to escape quickly. As Rufus looked for some means of escape, his eye caught sight of a small switch with the letter L. It was located under the desk so that it was hidden from view. It must be for some emergency use if it's placed here. Perhaps it will be of use in this situation. Rufus pressed it without hesitation. The floor beneath him snapped away with a clunk and he fell about one meter down. He landed on a hard sloping floor and began sliding down it. In the end, I still think I'm going to die. And not only that, It looks like I'm going to die inside an air duct that runs around the building's walls and floors. It's ridiculous. What would everyone think once they found my corpse? Right in the middle of a battle in which the planet's life was at stake, the president of the very Shinra company that had the power to fight with the enemy dies. Inside an air duct. (laughs) Heh. What a joke. It's a pity I can't see myself now. But what is it with this air duct? There's no reason why it should be built at such an abrupt angle. And that L switch. Rufus suddenly remembered a conversation he had with his father maybe 20 years ago. He couldn't help but laugh out loud. It was when he was only five years old. Rufus had woken up in the middle of the night to find that his father had just arrived home, which was rare. He was fully prepared to be sent back to bed as he hesitantly entered the room, but his father seemed in a surprisingly good mood 
and proudly showed him some new blueprints. They showed renovation plans for the president's office at the top of the nearby Shinra building. What do you think? This is the room where I give out orders to the world. Amazing. Rufus showed a lot of interest while trying to read the blueprints. He hoped his father would praise him for being so clever. However, he couldn't really make anything of them. He just blurted what was on his mind. Father, where's the escape route? His father couldn't understand what Rufus was asking. Escape route? What? If the enemy attacked, he needs some way to escape. Ah. Shinra Company has no enemies. Even if there were, the President's office is on the 17th floor. No one would be able to attack there. But Mr. Palmer said the enemy came from space. Palmer said that. His father furrowed his brow. It was a sign that he was angry. Palmer, head of the space program, could be in for some trouble tomorrow. But Palmer told him that being scolded was part of his job, so all would be fine. And anything would be fine, so long as he wasn't the one to get scolded. However, he felt that he had put his father in a bad mood, and that was anything but good. Father, I'm sorry. I'm kind of sleepy. Listen, Rufus. It's as you say. I will have an escape route built in case the enemy attacks. But let me make this clear, Rufus. I won't use it. It will be for you once you become president. Of course, there's no guarantee you will take my place. Father. <laughs> escape! Me. Father, I'm sorry. Why do you apologize? Are you admitting your idea was wrong? Yeah. You're such a simple-minded one. Rufus felt like he needed an escape route right then. We will mark out the escape route with something that really stands out. L. Don't forget it now. L for loser. Rufus was thankful. Even though his father thought so little of him when he was that young, he was thankful that he at least listened. The seemingly never-ending shaft that led all the way down to the ground floor from the president's office gave him plenty of time to reflect on his past. All of the trivial memories he thought he had forgotten went through his mind, over and over. When Rufus realized they were all linked to his father, he realized that he was just a boy like any other. All he wanted was a little recognition from him, and maybe even surpass his expectations someday. But he could only express this through insubordination and rebellion, which only led to his father either scolding him or just ignoring him. The tired old cliché of a relationship he had with his father somehow seemed more hilarious than any joke he'd ever heard. Rufus couldn't help but laugh as he slid down in the darkness. The shaft ended abruptly, and Rufus found himself sliding into a bright room with white walls. He slid with so much momentum that he crashed into the opposite wall. Yikes! <laughs> Rufus laughed again at the pitiful sound he made. It seemed like pure slapstick to him. He realized that he had broken some ribs, but still he couldn't stop laughing, and his collision with the wall had left him lying in an extremely unbecoming pose. The idea that someone might find him like this amused him even more. However, the pain from his broken ribs eventually pulled him back to reality. He maneuvered his body into a position that was less painful and slowly surveyed the room. It was a five meter square room. As well as the shaft's exit, there was a simple bed. The bedding looked expensive, but clearly it hadn't been used for some time. On the wall to the right of it was a cabinet and to the left was a steel door. Rufus slid over to the door, trying to bear the severe pain. There was no handle or knob, but there was a small panel which was obviously used to open the door. But Rufus had no idea what the code could be, and he didn't have the strength for trial and error. For now, he gave up opening the door and slid himself toward the cabinet with his legs. I'm in such a state. I just can't bear to be seen by anyone. The cabinet door opened easily. Inside were plenty of sterile boxes printed with the Shinra logo. He took one of the boxes from the bottom shelf, the only one he could reach. Engraved on the lid were the words, For L. <laughs> Rufus laughed out loud at the sight of the engraving, 
and again he couldn't suppress the laughter that welled up from the depths of his diaphragm, but his ribs immediately responded with piercing pain. He tried to control himself as he opened the lid. As he suspected, he found a potion and some painkillers. He put aside the potion as it had surely lost its effectiveness by now, or even become toxic. He did take the vial of painkillers though, placing it to his lips and tipping a few of them into his mouth. Then he relaxed as much as possible and waited for them to take effect. As he lay there looking up, his eyes focused on a giant owl on the ceiling. <laughs> Don't make me laugh anymore, Dad. Ugh. He realized he had taken a little too much of the painkiller as his mind slowly became hazy. Time passed. Surprisingly, the hours he spent under the effects of the medication were actually quite pleasant. However, he was also annoyed that at that moment, he couldn't stand at the head of his army. Finally, Rufus pulled himself up and walked over to the door. He supported himself against the wall and tried entering random combinations into the keypad. However, this venture was unsuccessful. The fact that he couldn't concentrate on the task at hand was surely due to the effects of the medication, but it was he himself who decided to take them in the first place. Reno and Rude stood in the ruins of the president's office. No one's here. No. We've searched everywhere, right? Yes. Three times. So he's alive? But where could he be? On the floor lay several steel beams that had apparently crashed down from the ceiling. They carefully searched the debris several times, making sure Rufus hadn't been buried under them. So, where else? With Meteor closing in, a permanent powerful storm raged. The Turks had no time to deal with it and continued their search for Rufus. The rescue party had made their rounds, but they still hadn't received any reports that the president had been found. Reno and Rude went through an inconspicuous door located near the entrance of the Shinra building leading halfway underground, which was intended only for the use of executives. The entrance was kept quite simple, which didn't quite fit the otherwise extravagant taste of the former Shinra president, Rufus's father. No decorations, no embellishments, just a functional, simple area. The ceiling, walls and floors were reinforced with exposed steel beams. Nothing here. Let's go, Rude. Wait. Rude stopped Reno and pointed to a section of the wall. The color's different. Rufus stood next to the keypad and stared at the keys numbered 0 to 9. It was clear that he just had to try all possible combinations, but it wasn't a particularly practical thought. He knew he would eventually lose track with that method. He had to think of something more effective. Maybe the code had a certain meaning attached to it, one that had a meaning to Rufus. He had already tried the meaningful numbers that both he and his father knew, his mother's birthday and the day she died. None of them were successful. He had no idea how much time had passed since he had been in this room. He figured that since he was still alive, Meteor had yet to crash into the planet and was still in the skies. In other words, Sister Ray had failed, and Sephiroth was still in the northern crater. Sooner or later, Meteor would wipe out everything and everyone on the planet. Rufus thought about death again. So... My spirit will become one with the life stream coursing through this planet. I wonder if father will be there too. Does consciousness have a shape? No. Such a powerful flow of energy would shatter the consciousness of any single human being easily. Ah, I see now. He laughed again when he realized he had forgotten one tiny detail. Soon there wouldn't even be a planet. He reached into the side pocket of his white suit and took out the vial of painkillers. He put three pills in his mouth, chewed them, and turned back to the keypad. <laughs> even if he was going to die, he didn't want to die like this. Since he first saw the keypad, a very specific combination had haunted him, but he hadn't tried it yet. He knew that by putting his hopes into this combination, he was admitting defeat. He didn't want to give his father that satisfaction. 
but this was no time for false pride. Reno and Rude examined a steel plate that had a slightly different color than the rest. It's just a wall, Rude. Before Reno could finish, the wall shook slightly. A steel panel approximately one meter square disappeared into the floor. Reno and Rude looked at each other before rushing over to the hole left behind in the wall. They could see a white wall through the hole. It looked like a small room. Anyone there? Reno went to look inside. But just as he was about to peep in, Rufus's face appeared through the hole. Good work. <sighs> the young Shinra Company president suddenly collapsed. Boss! While Reno looked after Rufus, Rude slipped past him and entered the white room. It was immediately clear that this was a shelter. Taking a quick glance around, he spotted that four of the buttons on the keypad were still lit up, but were quickly dimming again. Rude didn't know it, but the late president had always used the same digits on any equipment that needed a numerical code. It was made up of numbers he would never forget. The birthday of his son. Rude, go find a doctor, and check outside while you're at it. How's the boss? He's sound asleep. Looks like he's relieved to find us again. He's lucky. Rude went to take a look outside. Rude stood in the darkness at the back entrance of the Shinra building. The rain and harsh winds blasted against him. Everywhere lay beams and rubble from the outer wall which had fallen down. Floodlights had been set up on the ground to aid the rescue teams, as well as powerful searchlights from the helicopters hovering above. They glistened off the shattered glass scattered everywhere. Rude took a good look around, but remained calm. The fact that Rufus was still alive had given him all the hope he needed. Rufus himself was the Shinra company after all. Whether for good or bad, the company would live on. And this in turn meant so with the Turks. Who could hardly imagine a life without the Turks. Powerful gusts of a low-flying helicopter sent a chunk of wood flying, grazing off Rude's cheek. Rude smirked. He loved thrills, and Rufus always guaranteed to provide them. Taking care where he stepped, Rude made his way toward the front of the building. Everywhere people were huddled on the ground. Arms and legs sticking out from under the rubble were common sight. He wasn't sure whether they were dead or alive. Most people looked at Rude with blatant fear in their eyes. Perhaps it wasn't surprising with his shaved head and dark sunglasses. He didn't exactly inspire confidence. He just reeked of violence. Rude actually felt a sense of satisfaction with the reaction he usually got. Busily rushing around were the rescue teams, made up of hospital staff funded by the Shinra company. Rude grabbed one of them and told him where he needed help. He didn't know how he would react if he heard Rufus's name, so he made no mention of it. Is he a member of Shinra? Yeah. Then he has priority. I'm counting on you. The man nodded and called over to his colleagues who were carrying the stretcher then headed toward the back of the building. As Rude looked at them, he figured he should take the lead and went after them. Vincent, have you heard from the others yet? Just then, a young woman speaking over a radio caught his eye. Ugh, what's taking them so long? She was one of Cloud's companions. They were a part of a group that had fought against him. But for now, there was no reason to fight them. A confrontation was only necessary if they were ordered to, or if they stood in the way of an operation. Rude quickly hid in the shadows and watched as she nervously paced up and down. Reno watched the rescue team as they moved Rufus onto a stretcher. Where are you going to take him? We'll take him to the hospital, but after that, I can't say. Can't say? What the hell does that mean? I mean, the meteor's on its way. What can we do when the planet's about to be destroyed? Well, that's true. Yeah, come on, this way. Reno led the rescue team through a small door to the lobby. This place is pretty messed up. That bald guy could have told us about this shortcut. It's a passageway for executives only. Don't tell anyone. Yes, sir. Reno nodded, satisfied with the answer, and led them toward the main entrance. He was about to step outside when he caught sight of a familiar figure. He just took off like always. 
Don't worry, I'll get him. She stood with her back to him and hadn't seen him yet. He turned to the rescue team. Could I leave the rest to you guys? Something's just come up. Of course, you'll be in good hands. By the way, what's the patient's name? He'll tell you himself once he wakes up. Put him inside a good hospital room like you should. Could he be... Rufus Shinra? 